Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Edge Cloud Monetizing Your Beachfront Property, sponsored by Juniper Networks. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. On the left-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit them to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if we don't get to answer you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow Help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green Resource List widget. Towards the end of today's presentation, we'll ask you for your feedback. A survey will pop open on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to Heavy Reading's Principal Analyst, Jennifer Clark. Jennifer? Thank you, Beth. And let me add my welcome to everyone to today's webinar, Edge Cloud Monetizing Your Beachfront Property, sponsored by Juniper. Um, I will be sharing the, uh, the microphone here today with Wen Timotin, who's the VP of Technology and Edge Architecture for Juniper. Welcome, Wen. And Thanks for let me get started. Great, great. So let me, let me get started by um, just spending a few minutes setting the stage, giving you the macro picture of what heavy reading and OMDI are seeing in the market overall before I hand it over to Wen. Um, so first, this is some data from a global service provider survey that we conducted this year with over 100 carriers, and we're asking them um, their plans for virtualizing the network. As you see, if you look at the bottom, the Evolve Packet Core VPC shows the greatest momentum uh, in terms of vir virtualization among the carriers. And then, uh, because it's centralized, it's um, a nicely packaged set of applications and um, there's a fairly significant bang for the buck, especially in terms of CAPEX, uh, CAPEX and OPEX, uh, for them uh, transitioning that type of application fairly early on in, uh, in, in this journey to virtualization. But then we move out towards the edge. We move with, with virtual CDNs, with virtual CPE, with um, the mobile edge itself, and ending up with the, uh, with the VRAN or, or radio access network. Uh, you would think by the percentages shown here that maybe that's not a high priority for the carriers, but it's not so much that it's not a high priority. It's that it's a, a complex journey to start uh, moving the, the RAN to a virtualized environment. And But it's a very critical element for the virtualization plans of the carriers. And uh, when you query them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it's top of mind, especially as they transition to uh, 5G and they face the prospect of uh, multiplying their number of uh, RAN sites by a factor of anywhere from uh, three to seven or beyond. Uh, in fact, uh, so there are about 70 million base stations worldwide right now. Um, uh, and our Service providers are telling us, as I say, they're going to be doubling those in anticipation of 5G, and as they roll out 5G by, you know, a factor of three to five or, or seven or greater. Uh, but even when we ask them about their edge locations overall today, how many do you have today? How many are you going to have in 2023? Uh, they are at least doubling their edge locations by 2023. So the need to... Um, monetize those locations to have a, um, an ROI that, that um, proves in the necessity to um, multiply their edge locations is very important for the service providers. Um, when we're talking about mobile edge computing, we often look at the network and the compute side of mobile edge computing, but the storage element is, of course, critical to the entire um, architecture of a, of a mobile edge computing plan. Um, if, we, and if we look at what CDN revenue look like today and how they're growing over the next few years, uh, there, there's a robust growth in CDN in general, um, uh, but we are especially are seeing um, a lot of growth 
moved, uh, occasioned by um, the, uh, uh, the the current pandemic. For example, Akamai stated that it had seen a 50% increase in traffic relative to the average day. Uh, Verizon saw a 20% increase in total web craft traffic as uh, as COVID uh, took hold of the uh, uh, of the country. Uh, Limelight Network and CenturyLink, among other CDNs, have experienced uh, increased online traffic demands of, uh, of a similar magnitude. And on the content provider side, um, because of the flood of traffic onto the network, Netflix agreed to stream its content in CD in SD uh, within the U EU until uh, late April. YouTube, Amazon, Facebook, Instagram all pledged similar reductions in, in bit rate in order to uh, uh, provide a more equitable service to a larger group of people. Disney, for example, also delayed the official launch of its over-the-top platform in, in France. So um, we see the, the CDN um, the network along with the uh, broadband network stressed by what, we're, what is happening with COVID, but it re really is a portent of things to come. Uh, if we look at what our um, consumer customers uh, have been saying about uh, their um, experience during COVID, you'll see that they're grabbing onto some of these revenue generating services of, uh, of online subscriptions, of um, music, games, gaming, um, et cetera, podcasts, et cetera, uh, at, to see them through COVID. 18% of the respondents have significantly increased their usage of video uh, subscription services. 35% report an increased usage compared to pre-pandemic habits. And um, we're seeing, of course, a surge in subscriptions for some of the paid uh, subscription services like um, Prime, Netflix, et cetera. If you further query them on what their plans are post-pandemic, these are not really decreasing. And it's important when you look at um, the the growth in uh, some of these entertainment services as a result of COVID, it's important to note that the majority of video uh, traffic today is social video traffic, either pulling down, uh, either sharing videos, um, uh, Zoom calling, et cetera. It's much more... Um, um, equitable in terms of the balance of upstream versus downstream traffic. Um, and that is the majority of video. The quality is not great. Uh, consumers are looking for better quality. So the, so the question to the carriers is how to improve the customer experience, um, especially as these online services become even more critical to not only the enterprise but the consumer, the kids that are learning from home, et cetera, um, how to improve the quality um, while keeping their costs in check. So um, with that, uh, let, me, let me turn it over to Wen, who will take us through some of the um, solutions that Juniper has for uh, seeing us through this next generation of, of content and content delivery. Wen? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Wen Timotim. I'm VP of Technology and Agile Architecture at Juniper. Um, prior to Juniper, I was a CTO at StackPath, where I was brought on to help kind of drive the scale and, uh, and build the platform. Um, prior to StackPath, I was actually uh, Director of Engineering uh, and Acting Chief Architect at IBM Cloud. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, help build soft layer through the IBM acquisition and, and scale out uh, one of the largest cloud providers. And a very long time ago, I actually worked at AT&T um, in various roles. Uh, so I kind of see my career as an evolution of, 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 of where we are with Edge Cloud. Um, so for the agenda of this presentation, we're going to talk about the you know, opportunities and challenges with Edge Cloud, you know, how, you know, the build versus manage telco cloud options. Um, I'll also do an Edge Cloud demo of, of uh, what we've done with StackPath. And then finally, I'll talk about uh, monetizing the edge. So there's a huge opportunity and in financial incentive to invest in 5G and edge cloud. If you, if you look at the chart on the left, 
It shows the different 5G dimensions with enhanced mobile broadband, ultra-reliable low latency, massive machine type communications with industry verticals and use cases around the perimeter to show who's actually kind of paying for these applications. And if we drill down a bit, the enterprise segment represents the biggest opportunity with a total addressable market of 3.4 trillion by 2026, led by smart manufacturing and industrial automation using robots, AI, and video to drive efficiency, inventory management, and quality control. There's also public safety using drones, HD video, and location services, as well as healthcare with more reliance upon telemedicine, remote surgery, and connected ambulances. And what we've seen over the last few years really is that gaming and OTT video delivery have been the leading edge use cases. But there's a real long tail of potential killer apps we haven't yet imagined, but the possibilities are understood and application developers, service providers, and hyperscalers are all working to capitalize on this 5G edge inflection, which is creating some interesting dynamics in the market. Um, hyperscalers in particular, I think are making some bold moves to develop enterprise services and extend their cloud um, extend their cloud reach far out and into the service provider domain. So, you know, not wanting to be left behind, uh, operators are accelerating their cloud investment. So because cloud technology is the key to transforming from a provider of communications services to a provider of digital services, and a 5G is a top headline at its, um, as it's a native cloud architecture that spans from the VRAN access networks to the 5G core. And operators are, are pressured to get 5G up and running, and that requires a highly optimized and operational cloud architecture. But looking to the here and now, COVID has totally changed the way we work, learn, and play. And both streaming and kind of multi-party two-way video like Zoom and Microsoft Teams have kind of become the fundamental to our collective daily lives. So, you know, cloud technologies are critical to achieve, you know, the flexibility, agility, and cost containment. And you need to be able to dynamically scale up and down to support kind of the shifting regional demands and daytime peaks. But, you know, as discussed, enterprises really represent a significant chunk of the 5G services re revenue, and enterprises are, are continuing to even shift their legacy on-prem applications to public cloud. Um, so while that is going on in the enterprise, we see that service providers are cloudifying their existing network functions to kind of unify their network and services through virtualizing existing platforms via NFV or embracing more elastic and disaggregated models like control plane, user plane separation. So there's a lot of examples uh, and use cases, but the key takeaway is really that to achieve the desired edge and service agility required to successfully manage this evolution, cloud architectures must be horizontally aligned and capable of supporting any and all of these workloads. And multiple vertical and siloed clouds have proven to be in a, uh, kind of inflexible, uh, complex, and costly. So. Uh, you know, with a universal and horizontal cloud, it's possible to achieve the cloud outcomes that the industry has come to expect. Um, so first, you get agility, which will be, allow you to be more responsive to your customers, developers, and any kind of market demands. Uh, next, there's flexibility. So really to address the market and service needs with a dynamic and easy to use cloud model that is both efficient and cost effective. Um, we also have, you know, an assured customer experience. So through cloud technologies, and methodologies that automate the entire software lifecycle so that new and innovative services can be delivered in months versus years while achieving immediate software quality uh, in a single release. And you know, lastly, it's really value creation. How do you develop an edge monetization platform that enhances a unique and valuable beachfront property um, that is a re real true strategic and operator-owned asset? So, you know, what we've kind of seen with an early seat at the table is that uh, uh, a, su a successful adoption of telco cloud technology has kind of, kind of been slow um, with outcomes that simply, simply haven't met expectations. Um, so you know, back in June of 2019, Juniper held uh, an, an inaugural telco cloud council uh, in New York City to bring together executives from you know, the leading service providers for a two-day event to better understand kind of the challenges and success that, uh, uh, that they've had um, with regards to building and deploying telco cloud. So one of the most interesting comments that was made by a tier, uh, tier one North American operator was that, um, you know, when talking about their integration of the telco cloud technologies into their network, they said the marriage is happening in their lab. And this was a sentiment that was kind of shared by all the council members who needed help because they really needed help with, uh, uh, with, with a couple of you know, varying challenges. Um, so first was, you know, how did they close the, cl uh, the cloud skills gap and, you know, help 
you know, help themselves reskill their workforce and better understand the advantages that a telco cloud architecture could bring to both, you know, uh, their company employee and customers. Um, second was, you know, how do they simplify the integration of the NFDI cloud platform uh, with respect to the virtual network functions that run on top and the various APIs that have to be integrated with both, both northbound and southbound. And, and finally, you know, how do you lessen the burden of self-integration uh, with cloud architectures to make it easier to stand up and deploy a production cloud? Um, so in summary, what we, what we really learned and agreed upon is that the overall success requires an investment in people, technology, and processes together. Uh, and, uh, and really that's done to make sure that if you, if you address all three, uh, that's how you really drive uh, uh, value in your edge cloud. So, you know, now what we're seeing with the, as far as the distributed, uh, distributed edge um, is that, you know, 5G has kind of shifted the operator focus, uh, uh, you know, on how do I build an edge cloud. So, in, in addition to the early, uh, the early efforts, the distribution of the telco cloud is kind of uh, more about a distributed edge cloud model um, and it's become more top of mind for operators who want to pers you know, participate and benefit from kind of the long tail of uh, foreseen and unforeseen 5G application on the horizon. And when we talk about the visionary needs of like AR, VR applications and autonomous vehicles requiring, you know, low latency, high capacity services, um, but also the unsung heroes built around, you know, real-time video AI and analytics uh, for, con you know, quality control, smart factories, um, all of these are driving uh, some of the edge cloud designs that we're talking about with customers today. Um, and there's a lot of talk about uh, around edge computing, but I'm going to summarize kind of two key takeaways uh, for operators to consider. Uh, so first, you know, the further you geographically distribute the edge, the greater number of total um, edge cloud sites that are needed, which increases kind of both the per unit cost and upfront capital to deploy the network. And you could argue that, you know, an operator's command of cloud skills, technology, and processes are kind of inversely proportional to costs. So in other words, you know, the less experience uh, results, uh, you know, the less experience you have uh, results in greater cost, and this is especially true for edge cloud deployments. Um, second is, you know, the location of the edge is relative kind of to the SLA demands of the applications and services delivered from your network. So not all applications need to be physically close to the end user device. And we saw this with control plane user uh, plane separation with 4G. Um, so, you know, all clouds should be designed and capable of operating as a service edge, and operators need to be selective in where they deploy their applications and how they architect the application so that only real-time and latency-sensitive elements are distributed to the deep edge. Um, but what, we, what we've seen is that there's clearly a disparity across operators at the rate in which people's skills, technology, and processes are honed and operated, meaning operators need deployment options to help them align business goals and timelines with their own cloud readiness. Um, and it's kind of clear that operators need a cloud consumption model that offers both a build and operate and manage to cloud deployment options. And you'll have your more progressive and experienced operators that can take the build path, um, kind of developing their own telco cloud architecture, uh, and likely with the help of a trusted partner to manage the, the system integration. Um, but other operators are going to be kind of challenged by the upfront capital expenses, uh, maybe it's the skills gaps, or it's time to market pressures. And they may opt for a managed telco cloud solution, and that'll shift the operations and management of the cloud infrastructure to a partner in order to focus on the things that matter, and uh, you know, which may be you know, their customers, revenue, uh, applications they want to deploy. And it's our belief that operators will leverage a combination of both models to kind of achieve the right balance for their deployments. Um, so uh, let's take a look at kind of a tier one use case that we, uh, we help an operator uh, with, a, with a build approach. Um, so most of the tier one operators have invested heavily in building and managing their own telco cloud. Um, and here's an example with uh, a major Euro European operator uh, who, took, who took that cloud at first approach with Juniper. So after years of kind of developing multiple kind of VNF-led and vertical clouds, the customer took a more strategic cloud-first approach to replace their aging IMS voice network. Um, and the goals were to modernize their voice service through new cloud-based technologies, you know, eliminate snowflake cloud investments, and you know, lastly achieve company-wide transformational alignment. And the Tier 1 selected Juniper as both the prime integrator and a technology partner to kind of design, develop, and deploy that universal cloud platform to support existing and future virtualization needs and to establish a complete automation framework to meet the company's digital transformation objectives. 
Um, you know, Juniper was also working with the customer to kind of educate all levels of the company on the transformation value of this cloudification, kind of covering everything from basic cloud fundamentals to more advanced engineering certifications. Um, but the solution is kind of uh, itself is built upon an automation framework designed by Juniper and, and implemented using kind of DevOps based principles and a full CI CD pipeline uh, that uh, is common to kind of both cloud infrastructures and DNF services. And this well defined automation framework uh, was designed up front, allowing the universal edge cloud architecture to be built from an uh, kind of underlay of Juniper routers and switches and NFDI cloud platform based on Control Cloud. And the customer was able to build this cloud infrastructure and realize true cloud outcomes and really improve time to market. Um, and this ultimately resulted in a better customer experience and faster time to innovation, and all without any kind of vendor lock-in. So, you know, as opposed to the build-it-yourself model, we've actually kind of come up with a pretty innovative partnership for a managed edge cloud service. Um, so, you know, as an alternative for operators who, have, uh, uh, who are looking to um, leverage a managed service uh, where the NFDI hardware and software is you know, outsourced and managed by a partner, um, this allows the service provider to, to really focus on the things that matter, uh, like you know, running their infrastructure, deploying applications. Um, so hyperscalers were kind of quick to leverage their cloud experience to package an edge cloud as a solution offering, um, kind of giving operators that time to market. Uh, and you know, hopefully not burdening them with the cost and overhaul uh, or overhead of, of, uh, of developing a cloud technology. Um, but in kind of brokering these relationships, we've seen that some service providers have actually opened up their valuable real estate to a partner who may not be 100% aligned or invested um, in, in what they're trying to do and may at the end of the day be you know, ultimately just trying to capture the eyeballs um, of, the, of the you know, global population. So you know, what we found is that operators need the edge cloud as a service model, but, what they, but they want to deploy an edge cloud that allows them to rapidly monetize the edge without losing control, um, support and manage you know, the required public cloud inter, uh, interconnect, but all while offering their own revenue generating apps and services. So together with StackPath, uh, we're introducing an edge cloud as a service that leverages Juniper's service provider expertise with StackPath's proven cloud architectures kind of deliver an out-of-the-box edge cloud architecture for the operators, POPs, central offices, and re uh, remote sites, uh, uh, you know, based on what their, what their needs are. And, you know, the interesting thing about the solution, it delivers a managed edge cloud po uh, pod design to kind of overcome those uh, time-to-market challenges and deliver immediate revenues with the embedded CDN application running as a kind of first VNF workload on day one. And this allows operators to immediately reduce their backhaul transit bandwidth while engaging in an over-the-top revenue sharing model to introduce a new source of revenue. So, uh, you know, with a cloud neutral platform with open APIs, operators can then run any DNF or CNF on top of the platform in a very standard way, uh, and it can even partner with the, the public cloud offer, uh, operators without, you know, having to incur any of the costly egress penalties and really consume this all as a managed service. Um, so with that, uh, Jennifer, I'll hand it to you for our first poll question. All right. Thanks, Wen. So um, I encourage everyone to uh, select uh, one of our answers here to the following question. What is your approach to deploy an edge cloud architecture? Is it build and operate? Is it a managed edge service? Is it a hybrid of both? Or no plan? So please um, vote now. And... Uh, and we'll uh, check on the results in just a minute. In the meantime, when what do you think uh, what do you think we're going to see in terms of responses? I'm thinking maybe hybrid. Yeah, I, I think hybrid is is really the answer because um, you know I I think every operator will have different needs in different parts of their networks. Um, they're going to have you know different internal goals of what they think will drive value, and so in some cases, time to market is going to be critical. Um, uh, and, and deploying new edge services, but in other cases, they may, you know, they may th uh, uh, decide that you know owning and operating it and building it themselves is is, is the most critical function. Yeah, yeah. I, we're, I'm I'm seeing if we have any additional responses here. Yes. Okay. A few. So I th I I think you're absolutely right here. So 40, almost 41 percent are saying, hey, it's going to be a combination of both build and managed. Um, and interestingly enough, 
a higher percentage under build an operator. Those are some brave souls out there, uh, rather than uh, um, managed edge service. Um, and a, you know, over 10% saying, eh, no, pl no plans to distribute the edge cloud. So um, very, very interesting results. So let us, let me turn it back over to you, and, then, and I believe uh, we're going to be taking a look at a demo. Yeah, so, you know, this is uh, what we're going to show is a demo of, of uh, the Edge Cloud platform uh, that we've partnered with StackPack on um, and, and really kind of uh, showing, you know, how easy it is to deploy a distributed application. Um, so a little bit about StackPack, they have uh, 45 sites today, over 65 terabits of egress network capacity, uh, a fully functioning, you know, and, and fully at scale CDN, um, you know, that's delivering a lot of, uh, of traffic. But on top of that, they, they have a unified uh, platform and network to, where, they, uh, where, where it's also running their edge compute platform. So you have the ability to spin up containers and VMs at the edge. So here's the StackPath uh, dashboard. At the top, you kind of see where you could define CD insights. There's monitoring, object storage, um, also DNS. But we'll kind of focus on creating a workload. Um, so uh, once you select the workload, uh, you'll start by defining uh, the workload name. So here we'll define a global workload. Uh, you have the ability to select containers or VMs. So if you select a VM, you have a bunch of, you know, kind of golden images for various OS types. But for the demo, we'll focus on running a container workload um, called NetData. Um, and NetData is, is just an open source streaming telemetry app that's going to be pulled in from Docker Hub, which is the default repository but you have the ability to use th third-party repositories, custom repositories uh, for your container application. Um, so next, we're looking at the workload settings. Uh, we don't need any kind of custom environment variables, but we will add uh, an AnyCast IT address to this workload, which I'll go over in a sec. Uh, I'm going to open port 1999 uh, uh, via TCP uh, and then con continue on to the spec. So you can define different uh, uh, spec sizes. For this demo, we only need one virtual CPU, two gig of RAM, and secondary disk. You can actually mount persistent storage to your containers. Um, but for this, we're actually going to focus on the, the most interesting part, which is deploying an application. So rather than select a single location, you can actually tell the StackPath control plane where you want the application to run. So you can see here I've, I'm selecting multiple sites uh, to, uh, to run my application. And once I click Create Workload, um, what's actually happening in the background is the StackPath control plane is talking to all of its remote distributed sites and starting to spin up that application real time uh, uh, behind the scenes. Um, so you can see there that uh, the images are being pulled in and uh, they're starting. Um, earlier where I defined port 1999, it was actually defining network policies. Um, so you can define in, you know, custom inbound rules, custom outbound rules, kind of based on the needs of your application. Um, if we go back to the overview uh, and, and scroll down to the bottom, you can actually start to see uh, you know, the state of the applications. And um, there's already one running. So if I take that IP for the Seattle node, open a new tab on port 1999, you can actually see that the net data application is already running in real time. And uh, you know, based on uh, the host name at the top, you can see it's running at the Seattle site. But an interesting option is this AnyCast IP address. So StackPath will actually route uh, uh, based on source-based routing to the closest instance. So since I'm in Dallas, it automatically routed my traffic um, directly to the Dallas POP. Um, so this enables a new way to deploy distributed applications. Um, and uh, you know, this platform is, is then can be consumed by a service provider in their edge with an API first uh, mentality. So if you go to stackpath.dev, you can see um, examples of how to deploy workloads. And that example that I actually showed is a single API call. Um, so you know, a very efficient way to deploy a distributed application. Um, so there's the, uh, uh, there's effectively all the parameters within the API call um, that, that I went through in the UI. So you know, at the heart of the service is an edge cloud pod that comes in various t-shirt sizes. Um, so the operators can kind of select a pod that's best fit for their sites, kind of based on performance, scale, or other dimensions. And the pod uses Juniper's QFX and MX switches and routers for the underlay. StackPath's edge cloud, 
cloud software to host the DNS and CNF workloads, kind of all op on optimized white box servers uh, for efficient space and power. Um, so the software lifecycle of the pod is completely managed as a service so that operators can shift their focus um, you know, from actually running the cloud infrastructure to de delivering the services, supporting their customers, and growing their business. And, you know, StackPath already has an application content ecosystem of over 1,000 partners making use of their uh, Edge Cloud, uh, and all of those come day one um, as a component of the, of the platform. So, you know, here we'll actually kind of go over uh, what the day one edge monetization um, strategy looks like. So if you think about, you know, um, cloud technology and specifically the edge cloud, it's one of the foundational pillars of achieving digital transformation. And what we're showing here is a logical representation of this, of this managed edge cloud offering. Um, so box one kind of represents the service provider edge site. So this could be a point of presence, a central office, a CRAN, kind of any location the operator is using to deliver edge services. And the gray box uh, uh, embedded at the bottom, labeled Edge Compute Platform, represents our Edge Cloud pod, you know, consisting of the servers, storage, switches, routers, and the stack by cloud stack. Box two demonstrates kind of the immediate opportunity to drive new revenue and free up valuable capacity on day one through stack by CDN um, running on the Edge, uh, uh, Edge Cloud pod. Um, and if the OTT content, you know, whether it's a streaming video or gaming update, is delivered over the operator's network from StackBath CDN, StackBath uses a revenue share model to deliver that new revenue stream to the operator, operator allowing them to kind of participate in the OTT value chain. And in addition, the, the pod is open um, as, an, as an open compute platform so that any third-party CDN can run on top. Um, so, you know, while we talked about 5G happening now, Box 3 kind of represents the consolidation of all the VNF uh, or CNFs associated to 5G services onto this common platform. And so smaller footprint pods can be actually placed deeper into edge sites, whether it's a cell site um, or somewhere supporting, you know, 5G core to kind of enable the expansion of edge service delivery and support all of these new virtualized functions. So, you know, Box 4 uh, can also be looked at as a way to deliver edge services to the enterprises including, you know, SD-WAN, private enterprise edge, data, you know, edge data center services, or what Gartner likes to call SASE, which is a secure access service edge. And, uh, and, and this is where these services enable security and optimize uh, interconnection to the cloud uh, to be delivered from the uh, platform. And, and finally, you know, Box 5, the operators actually have the ability to open up this platform for any third-party applications, whether it's for gamers directly, other OTT delivery services, or they can leverage it as a cloud neutral platform to kind of host and integrate the public cloud ecosystems. So we're doing work with Google Anthos, um, Azure Arc to run on top uh, so that anybody who wants to use their control planes can run on a distributed edge. Um, so this offers a kind of a very flexible platform where operators can start with, you know, from day one with revenue generating services like CDN that enable them to subsidize the capex required to build out the infrastructure and then continue to consolidate more and more services onto that platform over time. So, you know, with that, uh, Jennifer, I think we'll open it up to another uh, uh, poll question. Exactly right, Lynn. So uh, here's our second poll question. What best describes your primary edge cloud monetization strategy? Is it CDN, enterprise services, third-party applications, like content and gaming, all of the above, none of the above, or no plan? So your edge cloud monetization strategy. What do you think, Wen? You know, we, we've heard uh, uh, various things. Uh, there there's, seems to be a, a very strong, you know, kind of uh, uh, appeal to the CDN strategy, just given all of the traffic spikes you talked about, you know, from COVID. Um, so having, you know, that backhaul East day one and a revenue share opportunity has been interesting. But there are others that are trying to focus on next generation use cases. So. Uh, I think the answers may, may kind of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, spread across all of them. Now, I'm definitely agreeing with you. Uh, the conversations that I'm having one-on-one -on -one with the carriers, a lot of them surround um, uh, storage at the edge focused on things such as uh, uh, focused on CDN type of services. And, of course, the second conversation that always comes up is, uh, is gaming-oriented services, so gaming-directed services that provide low latency, um, uh, and, and require some, some edge compute capability um, as well. But 
it's, uh, there are big questions about how to monetize those and, and uh, can they make their money back. So a, a platform that does a little bit of revenue sharing is something that um, I will think uh, the service providers are very interested in. So let's see what our responses are. Wow. So everything. Um, as enterprise services, CDN, interestingly enough, I would think CDN was higher. Um, gaming, uh, as I expected, not that high. It, it has a, it, it, our gamers are fairly price insensitive, but um, it's not a, it, it's a large community, but it's not an overwhelmingly large community that's going to support a large scale um, mech rollout without other applications as well. So uh, enterprise services, CDN, but I think all of the above looks good. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. And I, and I think the thing is, is you, you, you have to kind of take a multi-pronged approach. Um, you know, hyper-focusing on one uh, won't really justify the size and scale. So starting, you know, with a, a pragmatic approach of CDN day one and then layering on um, kind of, you know, the enterprise and next generation use cases, I think is, is really the, the, the safest strategy. Yeah, totally agree. So um, I'm going to hand it back to you, Ben. Thanks. Um, so, you know, as Jennifer, you know, said, you know, CDN being one of the leading services for, you know, VNF and CNF investments over the, uh, based on the operator feedback, but, and this is really driven by the kind of year-over-year -year bandwidth growth we've, we've seen. So, uh, you know, prior to COVID, I, it would have, I think the CAGR for CDN was around 30% a year, uh, but what we're seeing in, in some of the public filings of the CDN operators is that it's now, you know, 50% or more. Um, um, you know, just due to the new normal of working from home, remote learning, you know, online entertainment, um, and they've all kind of skyrocketed. Um, and using the embedded CDN service on the DVEG platform kind of provides immediate transit capacity relief to reduce costs and improve the end user experience. Um, and that OTT revenue sharing model uh, is, is, you know, becomes a really interesting option, um, you know, as it's a multi-sided business model for operators where they can actively participate in the content value chain um, to, to realize, you know, day one uh, revenue and savings. Um, so to kind of help operators understand their options, uh, you know, Juniper has developed a TCO tool uh, that allows them to kind of, com you know, allow customers to kind of compare and evaluate the edge monetization strategies ranging from, you know, do nothing to deploying a day one deep ed CDN to hosting multiple enterprise and third-party services from a highly distributed um, or deep edge location. And we've actually kind of done this analysis with a few operators um, from different theaters across the planet. And, you know, based on a five-year analysis, then we're, we're kind of seeing the following. So, you know, the first option is always not to invest. And, and what we've seen is that, um, you know, that may result in $100 million in, in just backbone investments al alone with no real ROI. So just increasing um, OPEX co CAPEX and OPEX costs to grow their backbones as, as these new trends occur. Um, but what we're also seeing is that, you know, through some of these edge cloud uh, investments, uh, they, they've been able to see that, you know, uh, with, the, with the CDN being a day one uh, use case, a net present value ranging kind of from $30 million to $115 million, kind of depending upon the inputs and scale. So whether that's, you know, 10 sites, 50 sites, 100 sites. Um, and over time, seeing, you know, cumulative revenue uh, increase from, you know, $130 million to $230 million, um, all with a city state cash flow of, of $95 million. Um, and that was, you know, based on a, a few different operator use cases, um, but really there is no one-size-fits-all answer. So, you know, with this new tool, we're actually able to, you know, uh, able and glad to help any kind of uh, any operators you know, and, and kind of guide them through um, the tool we build and how, you know, uh, we can do a meaningful analysis um, kind of based on what their needs are. So, you know, uh, the ability to kind of share the platform for both services and network functions is really kind of important to consolidating edge cloud investments. And we've, you know, we put more focus on apps and services, but the operator's cloud investments were really driven initially by the targeted infrastructure services. And with 5G kind of building momentum and operators looking for cost-effective, scalable, and agile 5G network architectures, um, you know, that achieve their time-to-market goals, you know, with a powerful and strategic edge cloud architecture. Um, so, you know, Operators have deployed telco clouds in the past, um, and it's kind of it's, it may be easy to do something once, 
But it becomes really hard to do something at scale. So when you're talking about hundreds or thousands or, or tens of thousands of locations, this is really where we think um, this platform becomes powerful. And, you know, and Juniper, we see this as going to be a hybrid cloud uh, deployment option where it's going to be that build and manage, uh, a combination of that build and manage approach. So it may be managed for, you know, the 5G core versus build for the RAN, or maybe the, you know, vice versa, just kind of depending upon, uh, 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 you know, what they need. But with 5G disaggregation and control plane user plane separation, it kind of allows you to place more of the control plane um, compute in centralized locations and then run your user plane functions for uh, not only mobile but also fixed uh, networks and, and, and have it sit, you know, sit at the appropriate place. So when you think about the infrastructure itself and then you weave in the CDN service at each location, you now have the kind of the capacity and revenue optimized platform, you know, uh, uh, allowing you to not only monetize your edge, um, but possibly even uh, fund your, your edge cloud deployments. Um, so on top of that, we start to think about, you know, the enterprise use cases. And, um, you know, the edge cloud can be extended to support, you know, SD-WAN and SASE use cases. Um, so, you know, as an example, we look at as, as every location becomes an open and horizontal edge cloud platform um, to kind of extend beyond the CDN use case we talked about and the NFC services, um, the, uh, uh, the NFP infrastructure services, you can actually now start to host enterprise service offering like SASE and SD-WAN. And as these enterprise services run as workloads on the edge cloud, you're now pushing application-optimized uh, application, application uh, routing and security as close to the end user as possible, kind of based on, you know, what the capacity needs, performance, or cost needs are, um, allowing you to, you know, deliver a, a much better and secure uh, enterprise experience. So, you know, I, we think finally the the... The, the real value is, you know, how do you, co how do you complete the consolidation of the edge cloud services, you know, like we talked about with CDN, 5G, NFC, and enterprise services, uh, and operators really need to factor in, you know, kind of the access to the hyperscale ecosystem of developers, content, and workloads. Um, so many enterprise and consumer customers um, have incorporated public cloud services uh, as an important part of their overall cloud architecture. And supporting and optimizing that multi-cloud and hybrid cloud ecosystem is, is, is a key and important part of, of the operator's value prop to their own end users. Um, and, but to achieve time to market, some operators may have over-rotated and engaged in exclusive relationships with public cloud providers um, to the, extend their cloud infrastructure uh, into the operator's valuable beachfront real estate. And so as operators are looking to evolve from providers of connectivity services to providers of digital services where they can participate in the value chain of cloud economics, they need to be more than an on-ramp to the internet and they need to position themselves as a destination uh, you know, to grow and prosper. So with an open and cloud neutral, uh, with an open and, and neutral cloud edge platform, um, operators can kind of run any NFB or revenue, revenue generating service they need um, and then be open and partnering with the ecosystem players. Um, and that's whether it's the hyperscalers, uh, some of the enterprise players, um, any, any, any of the companies that are, that are looking to deploy on the edge. Um, and, you know, as a result of that, they get to maintain control and protect their edge real estate. Uh, they, they get to, you know, build and own the relationship with their customers. Uh, they also get to participate in, uh, participate in versus, you know, simply enabling the OTT value chain. Um, and, you know, lastly, they get to support the customer's need for public cloud without losing control. So, you know, to wrap up, um, you know, the opportunity is there for network operators who want to transition from a provider of communication services to a provider of digital services. And the market potential is huge for the enterprise, government, and consumer verticals across all of the 5G use cases, and, you know, led by enterprise spend and a long tail of undefined but innovative apps and services that will depend upon, uh, depend upon a uh, highly distributed edge cloud architecture. Um, but to get there, operators have, uh, you know, they have deployment options, uh, and they have to really consider, you know, whether they're going to build or leverage an edge cloud as a service uh, with a trusted partner. And the deployment model, you know, like we talked about earlier and with the polls, will be a hybrid mix, uh, most likely. Um, but, you know, the way we see, the way we see it, the, you know, um, the most critical part of the journey and most important to kind of achieve the desired outcomes, they need to establish an edge cloud platform that allows them to kind of monetize their edge under their own control and build those long-lasting and lucrative relationships with their customers. So, you know, with that, 
Jennifer, I wanted to thank you for the time and you know open it up to uh, Q and A uh, to the audience. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Len. Very interesting. And uh, you know the analogy of of uh, uh, comparing the very valuable token of real estate to the beachfront property is certainly true. Uh, anybody who's looked at that market knows the value is not in what's built on the land, but on the location itself, and you don't want to give that away for free, certainly. So let's get started with some questions here. And let's start with this one. Um, what are the technical requirements on the Edge Compute platform? That was something I was wondering as well. What are we looking for in terms of, of what these platforms are going to look like? Sure. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we found is while, um, you know, the, the ambitions of moving to a cloud native platforms, um, uh, well, there, there's a lot of ambitions to move to cloud native platforms. Kind of one of the challenges with, a, with moving to cloud native is that uh, you would have to, you know, uh, deploy your applications in a, in a stateless and, and kind of, you know, microservices style architecture. And a lot of the carriers that we talk to, um, you know, they may be able to shift one component of their stack to, to that design, but there may be legacy VNFs or, or VNFs that were shifted to uh, CNFs that, you know, still need state or, um, you know, still need some kind of hybrid approach of being able to run VNFs and CNFs um, together. So the design, uh, the design for the uh, managed edge cloud service actually allows them to deploy uh, the, the containerized applications you know, directly with VNF applications, all in a similar way, all with those same API-like uh, uh, functions, and every workload in that edge cloud design actually leverages, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, or has the ability to to, to expose features like SROV. There, there's actually Spartanics underneath um, that allow for very high performance, um, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, very uh, low latency driven, you know, data plane uh, uh, forwarding. Um, so in our conversations with the carriers, we actually talk um, as a component of kind of that T-shirt sizing. Uh, we actually walk through what the edge cloud applications that they see would be their day one from from their own internal needs, where they kind of want to go. And um, you know, unlike some of the the other offerings from the hyperscalers, um, there's flexibility in uh, in, in in how those uh, you know how those edge cloud nodes get deployed. Um, so so that flexibility we knew we had to have because there was no one-size-fits-all model for the carriers. Absolutely. And, um, and you know, you mentioned SmartNIC, so the ability to offload some of those uh, compute-intensive um, uh, workloads like security and, and some of the networking uh, workloads onto a SmartNIC, uh, that's going to help the performance of the, of the VNFs as well. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. Okay, so let's uh, go to this one. How do you see CSPs filling the top of the funnel of devices, apps, API, and services um, to leverage this beach, beachfront property? So, yeah. That yeah, so uh, that, no, that, that makes sense. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's a challenge that, you know, we, we knew we would need to address and, and why we started conversations, um, you know, with some of the hyperscalers. Uh, and, and if you take a look at, you know, let's say what um, Google is doing with Anthos or Microsoft's doing with Azure Arc, they're effectively building a, um, a, a single control plane to run on top of various edges. Um, and the idea is that they can instantiate, um, you know, uh, they can instantiate VMs or, or, or uh, you know, control Kubernetes clusters to kind of federate all of the edges um, so that uh, they can maintain the same policy and framework um, across disparate edge, edge, edges, and it was critical for us to start those conversations and, and working with them to be able to run on top, so that they could bring their their ecosystem of customers uh, to the edge. Um, so, uh, you know, we think that's kind of phase one. There's other partnerships that we're we're working on, um, um, you know, because there, there will be no one size fits mo uh, all model. Um, but you know, abstracting and making the edge, you know, uh, kind of agnostic, depending, you know, uh, based on the design is. Is, is really the only way you'll make the edge successful. Uh, absolutely, gotcha there. Okay, next question. The latest RAN architecture has the RUDU and CU split. What's the best location 
of compute related to these functions? And what is the flexibility and associated implications of putting compute near the other functions? Yeah, so no, that's a great question, and um, and some of the some of the carrier discussions we're having about kind of next gen designs, um, we're we're actually seeing a, a hybrid approach of even even that specific component of the RAN. Um, so we've seen some where um, you know they they may go with a a flex RAN design um, with you know the RUs connected directly into a server um, uh, and the DU running as a as a VNF right on top. And then some of the things that we're doing with respect to integrated transport um, allows for, you know, will allow for, um, you know, things like end-to-end -end network slicing and, and some of our technology literally being embedded with the, within that cell site server design. Um, but then we've seen other within this, you know, from the same customer where half of the, uh, the other half of their cell sites, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe actually going back to a pre-aggregation or aggregation site um, where the, the DU and CU are, are still running as uh, uh, VNFs or CNFs, um, you know, but they're not actually running at the site. And it's just kind of based on, I think, the, the footprint they're trying to cover plus, um, you know, where they think they're going to get the most value with respect to, you know, the customers, um, the customers they're targeting. Yeah, that makes total sense. So uh, um, some at the RU, especially if you're going to be using a very granular network slicing strategy, some at the DU and CU uh, depend upon the efficiencies of aggregating that. So, great. Um, oh, and speaking of network slicing, how will network slicing impact uh, mobile edge computing? Um, so, I, you know, I, I think it's I, I think it's going to be you know really interesting with respect to um, you know the the you know, more sophisticated and latency sensitive applications, um, uh, you know, that, we're, that we'll see. So at the, at the beginning of my conversation, uh, of my presentation, I talked about, you know, um, uh, some of the emergency service use cases. So there's one carrier we're, we're talking about, we're talking with, who has actually talked to, um, you know, local municipalities and, and, and the hospitals about, you know, enabling um, a high performance uh, network slice for emergency services so that uh, uh, in the context of, you know, um, if an ambulance needs to uh, uh, send data to, uh, ahead to uh, a hospital so that a doctor can, um, you know, be prepared as, as the patient is coming in, um, you know, that be uh, a use case that they're wanting to enable uh, network slicing for, um, you know, but it, it's, it's got to be a pragmatic approach. Um, you know, one of the challenges is the traditional chicken and egg challenge of you can't offer the service until the infrastructure is there, and there's a lot of caveats to, um, you know, the uh, the orchestration that needs to uh, be enabled, the integration into transport. Um, so, you know, I think it'll be a little bit further to the right until we see a lot of those uh, slicing use cases, uh, uh, you know, really start to take um, take hold. Yeah, totally agree. Um, we see the network optimization slicing use cases deploying much more rapidly than ones that are associated with specific applications in the enterprise side. So totally agree there. Um, and how about what is the best revenue share model in this complex collaboration? Yeah, so that, I mean, that really depends. Uh, is a lot of it's going to be, you know, kind of based on the, the carrier, their footprint, where they kind of are in the world. Um, so, you know, um, you know, someone, you know, someone in, in the EU that is, you know, trying to cover a smaller country may have a much different challenge than, uh, you know, someone like Verizon or AT&T that, we, that uh, has to cover the continental U.S. Um, so, uh, so in some of the, the carry discussions that we're having, um, they are, you know, very, very constrained on their backbone. So the the cost savings of 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 not having to backhaul traffic and continue to grow that traffic is is really where they want to focus, um, and so uh, so that's where they're putting a lot of their energy. Um, whereas others um, have plenty of headroom for growth, uh, for for you know uh, backbone growth, and they're trying to look at um, okay, how do I enable next generation use cases so that I can you know start to sell new services to my customers. Um, so it's it's really going to depend on. Uh, kind of the state of, of the customer's infrastructure. 
I got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, let's go to our next question. To what extent does edge cloud depend on replacing layer two switching infrastructure in the transport network by with switches that support a southbound interface for SDM? Um, so I think that's going to be very carrier dependent. Uh, the the way we've the way we've uh, come up with this managed edge cloud design and our traditional telco cloud design was to kind of be a, as agnostic as possible, um, uh, you know, to the to to the underlay. Um, so part of the reason we're doing you know the things we're doing with SmartMix mm -hmm. is so that um, uh, we can you know we can do all the end cap and decap for any kind of tunneling needs. Um, you know, uh, in the smart mix, so we don't have to ask anything of um, the underlying infrastructure, um, and that allows for uh, uh, people to consume the platform without having to plan for kind of a rip and replace um, approach to their existing infrastructure. Um, so, so you know, we found that that is a, uh, you know allowing allowing us to be agnostic to what's running underneath. Um, but if you start talking about you know more complex use cases where you, you may want to integrate an edge cloud with an existing uh, any other existing uh, solutions that may be that may be running that may be a use case that you, we have to solve for but you know during the discussions uh, with our customers we'll, we'll set up planning sessions um, kind of like we did for that European operator um, to kind of help them up with that evolution um, to see if there is uh, something we need to do with uh, with re regards to legacy infrastructure excellent thanks Wen. Um, we are just about out of time, but we have time for one more question, and uh, that is on the Juniper Managed Solution, can you run any CDN, or do you need to run the StackPath CDN server? Uh, no, that's a great question. So, uh, uh, no, you can, run, you can run any CDN. Um, the StackPath CDN comes as a day one pre-integrated solution, um, you know, just for, for ease of deployment. Um, but if there's other CDNs that, um, you know, that are more painful or if the operator has their own CDN for their own, you know, OTT delivery service, that's something that can run on the platform day one also, uh, you know, kind of based on their needs. So, so, uh, so the, the Edge Cloud platform is designed to be agnostic to the VNFs um, or CNFs that are running on top. Great, great. Thanks for that clarification. And I think with that, uh, we're going to close out the webinar. A bunch of great questions. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions. If there are ones that we did not get to, and there are, um, uh, we, uh, we may get back to you on those. Uh, and uh, with that, let me, let me thank uh, Wen, you, for, for a great presentation. Very much enjoyed it. Learned some stuff on that. And uh, let me thank our audience and close it out. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.